All right. We are live. We are live. People are joining. This is our very first Enrollify panel webinar. This is our first panel, and it's going to be the first of many throughout the year. So look forward to that as the months go on. But Jenny and Jeremy and Artis are here with us today, and I cannot thank them enough for being my guinea pigs for this panel session, but also for being here to share their experience and expertise on this very important topic of connecting with digital natives in 2024. So let's go over a couple very quick housekeeping items first. Yes, this is going to be about a 45, 50 minute panel conversation, and we're going to do our very best to save some time at the end so that we can answer your questions too. Hello to our friends who are watching this on live streamed on LinkedIn. We are also taking your questions, so don't hesitate to send them in. We are also recording this session. So if it's 30 minutes from now and something happens and you got to hop off, we totally get it, right? Like that happens to us too. We're going to make sure that you get access to this session on demand. And that should hit your inbox tomorrow. But if not tomorrow, definitely by Friday. Set that chat to everyone because then we can all not just talk about ice cream, but we can talk about our very important topic of connecting with digital natives um, as the session goes on. And I know that this panel is coming with a lot of really great insights, hot takes, actionable insights and strategies. And so something tells me that this webinar chat is going to be bumping. And Soup, it's so good to see you in our chat room. Hi, Allison. Hi, Monica. Hi, Matthew. Thank you all so much for being here and for already starting to interact. All right, let's keep this party rolling. I got to tell you about these incredible people who I have joining me today. Now, hopefully you already know a little bit about these folks because maybe you listen to their podcasts on the Enrollify Network. But if you haven't met Jenny Lee Fowler, she is the host of Confessions of a Social Media Manager. Jenny is also the Director of Social Media Strategy at MIT and the author of an incredible book, Organic Social Media, How to Build Flourishing Online Communities. Jenny is a trusted voice in higher ed social media across the entire higher ed and outside of higher ed social media marketing space. And we are so grateful that she has joined us today. And maybe Jenny, by the end, you can tell us more about those jigsaw puzzles. Jeremy Tears is also joining us. Jeremy is the host of Mission Admissions and a Senior Director of Admission Services for Tudor Collegiate Strategies, the go-to higher ed partner for enrollment communications, as well as training for admission and enrollment marketing teams. Jeremy is also a well-known conference speaker. He's keynoted a number of the ACACs as well as other higher ed conferences. And Jeremy, we're going to need to learn about what type of ice cream you eat when you visit New Zealand at some point too. Artis is also here today. Artis Kadu is the host, one of the two hosts of Generation AI, one of the newest podcasts on the Enrollify Network and one of the fastest growing podcasts as well. You definitely want to listen to that one. Artis is the founder and CEO of Element 451, an ed tech company that is known for its AI-powered student engagement and CRM products. His expertise spans AI, tech, education, and design. And at Element 451, Artis has been instrumental in developing advanced personalization engines and AI features that really demonstrate his deep understanding of AI's practical applications. He's also been an educator at NYU, and I'm sure that uh, it is going to shine through in this panel today because every time I listen to artists do a webinar or give a presentation, I am just always struck by what a great teacher he is. Oh, and we're actually going to just stop that screen share because we're here for a panel. So you don't need to look at slides. We want you to look at us. We want to feel like we're in the same room with you. So like I mentioned, don't hesitate to start sending questions through that chat room, through the Q&A, or if you're on LinkedIn through live stream, we would love to make sure that we answer them throughout our session today. But I'm actually at this point, you've been listening to me talk for like five minutes now. We're going to give each panelist an opportunity for a little teaser, a little taste for the full meal that is this hour-long webinar. Uh, each panelist is going to have about two minutes to share their perspective on this very important topic of connecting with Gen Z. And Jeremy, I'm going to turn it over to you first to start. Thanks, Mallory. And I appreciate, as I said, everyone joining us today. 
It is becoming harder, as we all know, to get and keep the attention of anyone, let alone right a young person during their college search process. And so a lot of the things we're going to talk about today really tie in with personalization. And I can tell you that we do a ton of research with prospective and current first-year students at different colleges and universities throughout the year. And according to all the research, when I combine everything from the last three years, only 17.1% of students feel like the communications they're getting from colleges and universities feel very personal. The majority of students continue year after year in surveys to say it either kind of feels a little personal or honestly, it all looks and sounds the same. At the end of the day, personalization honestly, is the answer to a lot of the things that I know are challenges for enrollment marketers, admissions counselors, admissions leaders. So as you're listening to us today and thinking about things that you want to work on, if you want to increase your number of campus visits, incorporate more personalization. If you want to increase your number of apps or deposits right now, given the time of year, more personalization, not just to students, but also parents. Like Parents have to have separate messaging in 2024. So the more you personalize, the more you're going to stand out from your competition and you will build deeper and stronger relationships. It's also easier for your colleagues, right? To pick up on conversations when the previous person or people have personalized them. So we'll talk more throughout the webinar in terms of what personalization means, but I would just tell you a couple of real quick things. Personalization means that like they're actually getting an email or a text or having a phone call with a person. And the word choices and the tones you use need to be more conversational and less formal. And it can't always be the same three transactional calls to action, right? Which are visit, apply, deposit. There has to be more if the conversation's truly going to feel personal. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate that. Jenny, over to you. Yeah. And, you know, I think part of the challenge is those who are thinking about communicating to this audience. We think of marketing and communications, and then we think of social media as this separate channel. Um, But, you know, one thing we forget is like, you know, they're this generation are digital natives, right? So there is no separating mobile, if I can ship like the your mobile device and social. It's it's all the same thing. So if you think about it, you know, Gen Z, they order food, they order, they get a car, you know, they, you know, right to come right to the, where they are. They, um, they do their banking, they pay each other like on their phones. And sometimes they don't uncouple the fact that it's social or yeah, they don't, they don't separate the fact that it's social and your phone. They just, it's all on your phone, your mobile phone. So I think um, we really have to think about what is the experience? How are they experiencing your brand or interacting with you on their mobile device? Is it clunky or is it is it easy and seamless and really, um, you know, a, e- easy to navigate? So I think a lot for this generation, you really have to kind of think mobile first um, when you're, you're, you're creating and crafting your communications campaigns and marketing campaigns. Jeremy says 17% of these students don't feel like it's personal. Jenny says you got to remember that mobile first mindset. Artists, what do you have to say? I'm going to go with stats and I'm going to continue the stat, the stat game. So uh, Gen Z or what we call the native generation spans for those of us. So just some definitions. It spans, they were born between 1997 and 2012. And There's about 69 million Gen Z individuals living in the U.S., a pretty large population. They're the most racially, ethnically diverse generation in U.S. history, with about um, half of them being white and the rest Latino, Hispanic, about 25%, Black, 15%, Asian and Pacific Island, about 6%, and and 5% on the other demographics. Um, They're on track to become the most educated generation in history, with 44% of them living with parents who had a bachelor's degree or higher in in 2019. So even though they're really highly educated, they're still kind of living at home and being influenced by that. Despite their youth, there are 38% of them, of Gen Z, they have entered the workspace, the workforce. 
So as someone who um, is raising a Gen Zer uh, 2012, actually on the cusp right there, Gen Zer, Gen Alpha, you can see that there is a there's a wide gap in there, and we're now seeing Gen Z entering um, not just colleges and universities that we've been talking for the past five to ten years, but that generation is entering the workforce as well. And they're becoming the folks who are in the in the generation who is actually serving our students and interacting with them. So it's, you know, uh, they are adopting technology at a faster, faster rate. When you're looking at them from a AI perspective, they're adopting AI at the fastest rate. They're using it not just in the classroom, they're using it to um, you know, for work, and they're expecting those experiences to be the same on the institution side, uh, fast, uh, personalized, better, like Jeremy and Jenny said. So I'll leave you with a lot of those numbers in mind, and we'll kind of touch base on on how that affects, um, you know, how we actually reach them and how we communicate and engage with them. Well, Artis, you set up our first poll perfectly because we want to hear from our audience about how you are currently reaching those Gen Z students born from 1997 to 2012. This is multiple choice. So if you're using multiple channels, feel free to indicate and click every single one of them. We're going to let this run for about another 20, 30 seconds or so. Artist, I didn't realize one of your kids was right on the cusp there. What do you see any interesting characteristics from uh, your 2012 born child that doesn't exist in your younger kids? Yeah, I mean, so so they don't have much difference. They're about two two and a half years apart. Um, however, I I definitely see a lot of differences when it comes to. Um, you know, how they're using technology and how open they are to using technology, um, how they're thinking about, um, you know, the world and how they're interacting with their friends and how they're, um, you know, they're they're kind of expecting things. So getting questions quite a bit on, well, you know, very interesting questions on, um, for example, having to print stuff out or or having, you know, kind of those those kinds of workflows that that it, it like we we say certain words or we say certain things and they're like, well, what does that mean? And I'm like, oh, of course, you don't know that right. um, you have to replace the cartridge on the printer because it's printing white. So, <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Well, I am displaying the results of our poll. And Jenny, I think you're going to be pumped to see that 79% of our attendees are indeed using social media to reach this audience. 54% say they're using digital paid ads. 79% say they're using email. 54% say they're texting. And 3% are like, I've got no idea, but I am here and I am ready to learn. So I love that. All right. We're going to do one more quick poll before we dive into some additional questions for our panel. Let's go back and launch this one. All right. So here's a little fun higher or lower question just to test your knowledge. Is the percentage of Gen Z that says the subject or what, sorry, is the percentage higher or lower, right, of Gen Z that says the subject line is the number one thing that gets them to stop and open a college email, higher or lower than 25%? We'll let this one run for a minute, but I can tell you I'm watching the numbers and it's skewing in one direction. Jeremy, I'm going to cue you in to give us the answer too. So here we go. We're going to close it in five, four, three, two, end that poll. 75% Jeremy said higher, 25% said lower. Who was right? So the higher group is correct, but barely. It's only 29% according to all the data I have from the last couple of years in terms of all the surveys we've done. Wow. All right. So let's remember that stat, y'all, as we dive into these questions. And we're going to start our first question. Jeremy, I'm actually going to be tossing it back to you because we're going to be talking about adapting to new trends. And I think, you know, we we know Gen Z, these digital natives, right? They're constantly evolving and how they use technology and social media. Jenny kind of spoke to that with that mobile first mindset. They do everything on their phones, right? They just adapt very quickly. Artists noted all about uh, AI and, and their quick adaption of that tool too. So how should institutions adapt their digital marketing strategies to stay relevant and appealing to this audience? And 
Jeremy, what current digital tools and platforms are you seeing proving most effective in engaging with Gen Z? So in terms of how you should stay on top of everything, the number one piece of advice I would give anybody listening or watching this is you need to, from a timing and communication standpoint, figure out what the people you're communicating with are comfortable with. And I find that too often it's like, well, we want to tell them this or we want to send them this. But the question is, are they comfortable with it? You know, Jenny hit a lot on being mobile first. It's amazing to me when I go to all these college campuses, there are certain strategies that should be in place, you would think, in 2024 that aren't and make, for example, communicating on mobile and certain platforms just a little bit harder, right? And so staying on top of what your audience is comfortable with, not just from a communication standpoint, but also a timing standpoint. And the easiest way to do that, I think, is to survey each year, both your incoming students and your current students. And the key is not asking necessarily the questions that you want to be able to show You know, certain people on campus data around. It's, all right, what questions can we ask to really get our audience to explain to us Hey, like you guys communicate way too much. You need to stop sending so many emails or you need to do a better job of utilizing texting or please stop, you know, just cold calling, you know, students on the phone. None of, you know, none of us enjoy that. And so I think empowering your current students or incoming students to share what they are comfortable with is super important. And then utilizing that data as part of your strategy. All of the data I have, again, with Tudor Collegiate Strategies, and we are just nonstop every year surveying different groups of students, both high school students as well as incoming or first-time college freshmen. All that data shows that students want a mix, Mallory, of different communication mediums still in 2024. And so by a mix, what I mean is they're still comfortable with getting letters in the mail. They're still comfortable with email. They're still comfortable with phone calls, believe it or not. Some, not all. And they're still comfortable with text messaging. And then social media, which I'm going to let Jenny hit on more because I know that's 110% her wheelhouse. It's used completely differently, but I feel comfortable saying, you know, nobody or very few are wanting you to DM them on Insta or find them on TikTok. And now that's it's not how they want social media used. They want to see more of the current student point of view. And in terms of frequency, the data has been very clear, everyone, for 10 years. 10 years is how long I've been working at Tudor Collegiate Strategies. We've been asking this question. Hundreds of thousands of students have responded. What is the frequency you're comfortable with getting all of these different communications? The preferred preference for almost all communications is no more than at a bare minimum or bare maximum, excuse me, once a week. So like if you're going to email students, the majority are like, no, I don't want one every day. I don't want multiple times a week, both of which are options they can choose on these surveys. Once a month, never actually is an option. They're like once a week, right? Phone calls, once a month. Text messaging, once a week. But as I'll explain later, certain stages in this process, they'd prefer you don't text them. Letters, absolutely, once every couple of weeks. But again, it's very clear that they'd much rather get letters earlier in their college search versus more towards the end of the process They're that much more comfortable, right, with texting and email as the primary means of communication. So it's just understanding that, like, you need a variety of different communication streams and mediums still in 2024. Email is their preferred method, if you ask them. Texting is becoming more accepted. And phone calls, as I said, despite being uncomfortable to many, are still, believe it or not, when we ask them, well, what's the most personalized form of communication back to personalization you can do? A phone call feels more personal, students say, still in 2024, when you do it right, aka a way they're comfortable with, than any text, any email or letter you can send them. Because while students in this generation doesn't, for example, know what Slate is or what Salesforce or Element 451 is, they know what a CRM is and they know that you can mass text and mass email and they're convinced so much of that comes from bots. It's much harder to be on a phone call and like, fake basically who you are on the other end of the phone. They know it takes more time and effort. And so as you're thinking about your comms, continue to involve your students in this process and make sure you're communicating in ways that they're comfortable with, frequency they're comfortable with, and then just make sure, again, you're doing it in a way ultimately that feels personal. Otherwise, a lot of it ends up just being noise that they don't look at. 
Yeah. So, uh, Jeremy, I I do agree with a lot of that. Um, one thing that I do have to say though is that um, even phone calling now is something that is done through bots, and some of the AI, you know, driven responses and agents are are super super believable. Um, they're actually even uh, being used for deep fakes and 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 you know, faking family members. That how good they are in terms of being responsive. So so the the channels have changed. The uh, you know the the different ways of getting that message out there has changed. But but one thing to kind of think about as as you communicate with the generation, it's not about the channel. It's not about necessarily about you know how often you send communications. Which yes, there is those tactics that that we can come back and fall back on. But at the core of it, you know, it's really how they perceive your messaging. So it's it's not about push communication anymore. It's more of a conversation uh, that needs to happen. And when you look at it, you you have to be brands have to be genuine now. You have to be direct, honest, genuine in your communications. Just avoid a lot of the uh, the stodgy, you know, um, you know, very formal stuff. Um, uh, kids know when you're. Uh, well, I won't say kids, but Gen Z or this generation. Sorry, but th th they know exactly when you're being uh, dishonest or when you're when you're kind of talking corporate talk or you're talking that. And of course, I hear quite a bit now. It's like I say a word or I say something with my kids, and I hear the word uh, cringe quite a bit. It's like, oh, that's cringe. I'm like, I'm like, what does that even mean? So anything inauthentic, anything that is not, um, you know, like that they don't believe it's coming from a place of um, kind of genuine uh, or a real person or real responses it's it's coming off as cringe right and that's we got to stay away from that and the other part is like just own mistakes they want to see uh, brands being real uh highlight real people and stories behind the institution so showcasing students and and employees and like that's like buildings are gone like we don't care about buildings anymore we care about people and and their stories and, and kind of how they come through. And and th a lot of those stories are being told best in this very short, um, you know, mediums like TikTok and Instagram and, and even YouTube on YouTube shorts and so on and so forth. Like my kids would just go through YouTube shorts all day long and and kind of go through them. Of course, we put kind of time constraints on it, but, but that's something that's happening quite a bit. Um, and then the other part is, you know, one of the things that that ha we haven't talked a lot about is that we have the rise of influencers that are happening right now, and and a lot of these kids that are going to school or or even coming in, they're influencers within their own right, and they're doing a lot, and they're being taught since early. I want to be a YouTuber, I want to be an influencer, so they're doing everything possible. So so having institutions partner with influencers and creators. Um, that you know that Gen Z trust, like it would go a really long way. Um, I, I believe I heard someone. Uh, there was an interview uh, recently with. Um, anyways, I forget where I heard it, but but Mr. Beast is uh, is someone who who a lot of us would probably know right now. Um, and uh, Mr. Beast is um, like he he East Carolina, so ECU down here is it lives very close to ECU, and he's been calling in there all the time to do something, um, you know, with with that campus or the institution. And and I'm like, why wouldn't they just take advantage of that? Like ECU should be all over social right now because because the proximity to Mr. Beast and and kind of what they're bringing. So I want to get off of my soapbox right now, but I feel that, you know, institutions, we're, we feel like we need to be very proper and very a certain way. And we talk about tactics rather than, you know, the, the, um, uh, the approach uh, and, and how we should be thinking about it and, and how the, this audience is, is very different on the message, right? The message needs to be different. Yeah. I actually agree a lot with what artists just said, um, you know, the mediums may change faster than you would ever think. Um, and, you know, and they and each platform in itself evolves, but your mes message and your culture, especially, I mean, if you have a good culture should remain the same. You don't want to, you know, worry too much about hitting all the latest trends. And I am looking um, at this through a social media lens. So, um, you know, there are so many trends out there all the time. You don't have to worry about each one of them. Um, you don't want like a hello fellow kids moment. 
moment, right? Um, and as artist was saying, uh, yeah, like the cringy moments. And, and for me, it's just anything that just sort of makes you, <laughs> you see it, you just cringe, right? It just makes you cringe. Um, so I always say, especially um, with your social media presence and, you know, your social media content, you really want to lean into what makes you, you. That's what the students are looking for anyway, right? A culture fit, a personality fit. Um, you want to, you know, make it, you want to do what makes sense for you. You want to be on the platforms that make sense for you. And you want, um, and, and you want to know how those, you know, what, like one thing you do want to learn and that evolves is how the different generations use the, the platforms themselves. So you definitely want to learn how Gen Z uses it. Cause it's definitely, it's different from how the boomers used it. It's different how, to how like the millennials used it down to how you take selfies. Like, you know, um, you know, nowadays Gen Z and Gen Alpha, they can tell your age by how you take a selfie and the angle that it's at. So you want to be really familiar with how the generation, different generations use um, the platforms natively and you want to um, do the same, right? And you want to present your uh, content like you, like you know who you're talking to. And um, so yes, like, you know, but, you know, very like tactically, I would say that right now, Instagram, TikTok and LinkedIn are where you'll find Gen Z. And yes, Gen Z is using LinkedIn. It's just not the same. Right, exactly. It's just not the same way that like I use, you know, um, LinkedIn. So, it, you know, we have to learn their habits and mannerisms in order to effect effectively engage with them in these in these spaces. Oh my gosh, I would have never guessed that Gen Z was already on LinkedIn. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. But Jenny, you said, you know, about like how you can tell based off of the selfie. I've been getting served in my Instagram feed these hilarious little videos where it's like the millennial parent on one side and the Gen Z or Gen A on the other. And they're given the same prompt, but they can't see each other. And it's like, take a photo, answer a call or whatever. And just the hand gestures yeah, are are so wildly different and I've never felt so old watching those <laughs> videos. So we started to talk a little bit about this word authenticity, right? I think since I've started working in higher ed, there is no word that I've heard more <laughs> my career than the word authenticity. It's like become this word that I'm like, oh my gosh, are we going to talk about authenticity again? Like, great. But, but why do we talk about it? Because Gen Z, because people in general, they can sniff out the BS, right? They know when you're not being authentic, when you're not being transparent. And so, Jenny, I'm going to throw this actually back over to you. Let's talk about this a little bit more and let's turn authenticity not just into a buzzword, but right, something that's actionable, something that we can actually uh, do meaningfully. So how, you know, what what are some effective ways that maybe you at MIT or or advice you would give to institutions how can you demonstrate authenticity and transparency in these digital content, in the digital interactions that you're having, in the digital content that you're putting out? Yeah, thanks, Valerie. I, I think um, just like authenticity is not a new word, um, but it just seems to be a challenge. It's um, something, it's like, a, it feels like a moving target, right? One that we are constantly trying to hit, but it's moving around on you. Um but, you know, my answer is not going to be, you know, rocket science either is it's it's to design for your audience. And I think part of our challenge today um, and is is that we're still creating content for those who approve the content or those who are like writing the checks for the campaign budgets. Right. Or the agencies and not for the audiences we actually see. So I've been I've been in so many rooms where, um, you know, they'll sort of, dis you know, there be a, a team of people, maybe an agency, or maybe it's an internal team that um, sh uh, like unveils a campaign um, theme, or, you know, sort of like the essence of a communications uh, strategy. And, you know, the, the senior person in the room will sit there and they'll say, I don't get it. <laughs> so I and, you know, and I just think, okay, well, you know, if you do, it's probably not the right message that you want to hit to target, 
your audience. And so I, I you know, I think that, it, you know, this is not a new concept, but we have to design for our audience. And we have to realize that, you know, the language changes, the essence changes, the slang changes, like, it's, it's oh, and it's okay, because, you know, we were some of those that made changes, too. Um, so I think that, you know, one thing that's sort of a no duh thing is that we should just ask our audience what they want to see and what they want to hear and design for them in mind. And I think that some of this is it's um, it's an organiz organizational cultural aspect, but we have to put aside our egos and, you know, we have to realize that we don't have to get it because we want our audience to get it right. Um and it's it and it's I know it's sort of a culture shift thinking, but I think it's uh, it's necessary, right? And I, I think we would do better work and create better content if if we actually design for our our audience. There is no better. So uh, one of the questions that uh, came through the chat is, well, okay. First of all, let me let me take a step back, and maybe this is going to be controversial, but um, just like our politicians, like the age of uh, senior leadership in universities and colleges is going higher and higher, right? So that we don't, you know, so so there is a huge disconnect there between you know leadership and and kind of the the folks who are actually dealing with the students every day or who are reaching out to students. So so we're we're kind of in an interesting place, Jenny, where you're saying, hey, if you don't get it, then probably this is not written for you and and we need to kind of react differently. But how do you convince somebody that, um, you know, a, a beautifully designed piece of content is actually not going to get the, the, the effect that it needs, even though you're, you're sinking so much resources into it. And the best way to do that is through data. Right. Um, so if you can, if you can show, you know, go back to history, go back to your history and show, here is a piece of content that we it took us five minutes to generate, and it was very quick and authentic. And look how many reactions, and look how many engagements it, it received. And look this other piece of content that spent you know we spent one, one month, and and here's the budget for it, and here's the reaction. So if our if we are playing in the uh, in the attention economy right now, and that's something that you need to communicate to to leadership, and you need to communicate internally, is that we're we're playing in the attention economy. It's not about you and and it's not about you know your message is it good enough or is it not good enough against your other institutions is is it good enough against Mr Beast is it good enough against this other brands that that you're competing for the attention there's only so much attention that you have and if you can't get through that message or you can't get through that uh, moment in time then it becomes really irrelevant and you can spend you know so much money on it and, and not really get through so two things i would highly recommend look at what is happening in culture popular culture and try to align your messaging and try to break through and piggyback on that because attention uh, if you're piggyback on that then then you have something to say you can you can make comment on on social on the um, kind of popular culture you can make comments on on what's happening out there so everybody is aligned with that and don't just you know necessarily new stuff but also uh pop again pop culture so so be in tune with popular culture because that's what your audiences are are paying attention to and then the other part is that make sure that you have a uh, very small consumable uh, messaging and content that is is digestible uh, less than seven seconds is the attention span of this generation less than a goldfish so there's they're they're scrolling very quickly through that stuff so you can't have a paragraph and say oh this is perfect like it, it conveys the message it's like it doesn't matter because they already passed by it they just saw the first line so so seven seconds and stay in tune with popular culture in order to piggyback on that to get your message across And I would add, you know, artists had on something perfect there. You've got seven seconds, right? So like if any of you, and I know this is going to be so obvious, but yet everybody keeps doing it in a lot of cases, stop starting an email to a 17-year-old with deer. You can't do that anymore. And there's tons of schools because we see the messaging. And when I lead trainings, I ask and people cringe. A 17-year-old looks at that and goes, that's completely inauthentic. That message wasn't created for me. And it's just going to be harder to artists' point to then get their attention again. 
And I think building on that, don't ever assume that once you have somebody's attention, oh yeah, Mallory paid attention and talked to me that first time. Oh, she'll talk to me every time. Yeah, no. This generation has so much going on in their life and has so much information coming at them. And so back to a point Jenny made, designing for your audience, well, how do you do that? And as I put into a couple of the people, Logan asked, I believe, on the chat there, you've got to be able to show senior leadership data straight from your target audience, which means some of these surveys that schools do, and I see some of the questions, you have to change them and stop asking questions that you want answers to versus what do we really need to know to better understand the pain points and how we can better serve all of these different students, knowing that, wait a sec, what a student who's a first gen wants is totally different than a student who's not a first gen. What a student of color wants, what a student who's out of state wants, like, there's so much there that if you don't design for your audience, as Jenny said, your jobs just become harder in terms of getting their attention at any point in this process. And that, again, at the end of the day, is what gets them to take action. I mean, we ask on these same surveys I've referenced a few times, when you went to make your college decision and you chose your college, like talk to us about the things that were super important in your decision. The customer service and how different people treat them is always in the top two or three, along with affordability. And then occasionally things like, for example, location or student outcomes, right? Show me the path in terms of if I'm interested in this major, how I'm going to get there. But people all make decisions the same way. We all make decisions based on how we feel. And if we feel like you're being inauthentic to us, guess what? We're going to pay less attention or we're going to figure out how quick we can get off this call. Or I've had tons of admissions counselors tell me, um, Jeremy, people hang up on me sometimes. Like literally I'm in the middle of a phone call with a 17 year old and they just hang up the phone. Well, yeah, if all you're doing is vomiting information and sounding like a robot, 100%, that is not going to resonate with this generation. So the other things I would add real quick, Mallory, about authentic engagement and everybody watching and listening is, if you're going to ultimately sound less scripted, I'm not saying you have to like, please let me be clear. Do not do what my daughter does to my wife and I. I have a 14 and a half year old daughter. So artists like you, I have a Gen Z around because my daughter's like, what up, bro? Yeah, no, I'm not your bro. I'm your dad, Olivia, is what we tell her all the time. Like, you can say that to your friends. Please don't ever, right? Tell a 14 year old if you're listening to this, like, you don't have to say that. You don't have to use the words bussin. You don't have to do any of the slang, right, to get their attention. You just have to sound normal. That's all they want. Like, sound like somebody who genuinely wants to know who I am, why I'm looking at your college, what I'm scared about, where I need help, and why I may or may not be willing to take whatever the next step is in the process. And so that takes time, though, and is not something that a lot of times is going to happen just because, again, you give them a ton of information. Jeremy, I do want to like one, one thing to kind of piggyback on that. This generation cares a lot about money and their well-being. It's not like before where it's about, let me show you this beautiful building over here and then everything else goes out the way, right? They care about it. They're, they care. They, they want to be real. It's like, you're going to make this much money. You're going to. And that's, I, I saw some of the comments that saying, well, why do people care about Mr. Beast? Because he's a gazillionaire, right? And he's like, he's a YouTuber and they make a lot of money. And that's what, you know, they, that's what they are caring about. So they're, they're very fiscally uh, aware and they want to understand that. And um, they're very aware that the buying power, their buying power and, and the jobs and what's happening is that that's, that's lower and lower uh, what well, we were before to now. So, so the 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 ability for us to communicate that is is even more important. So, I, I do I really like your, what you said, Jeremy, around being real and and being very transparent. And it's like I want to talk to you about what you care about. You know, you might not care that our professor has X whatever um, uh, degrees, or or he just applied for an NSA grant, and then he got and like those things might not matter to them. They care about they're very internally focused on, around their their outcomes. They do care about the environment. They do care about social causes quite a bit. Um, but yeah. Well, and, and to your point there, artists, you hit earlier on storytelling and, you know, being able to showcase different, which 100% is, is super important. 
the key in doing that right and having it land and feel personal is not just sharing for the sake of sharing, right? It's back to personalization. One of the things that makes something land in a personal way is when it's relevant to your audience, right? Well, how do you know if it's relevant to your audience? Well, you can guess, and sometimes you'll guess right, sometimes you'll guess wrong, or you can just ask better questions, more direct questions to learn, okay, this student's interested in this, maybe I'll share a story about that professor artist, like you said, right? That's how something lands and then sticks, right? Because ultimately, back to, I mean, if you remember one thing, I think, from this entire webinar, in my opinion, I already said it earlier, this is all an attention game for all of you watching this, whether you're a marketer, an admissions person, the whole point is there are all kinds of people outside of higher ed and inside of higher ed trying to get these young people and their parents and families' attention. You have to do it in a way that, again, feels authentic. And a lot of times, one of the easiest ways to feel authentic is just just sound normal. You know what? If you're a little wordy, that's okay. And if you want to joke, I mean, somebody put it in the chat earlier. I don't remember who it was, but I saw it like you talked about your drip. Like occasionally to get somebody's attention, absolutely it's okay to do something like that. I'm just saying that doesn't have to be right. You don't need bra in every email. You don't need like bussing in every email, right? You just have to find ways ultimately to sound normal. Word. I <laughs> love that, Jeremy. Jenny, we're going to go off script for a sec because I caught a question a little bit ago when Artis was talking about, um, you know, making sure it back to the attention economy here, right? Like one way to grab attention is to be paying attention to the pop culture trends and to be integrating those into your content when it makes sense. And I think it was Logan who asked, you know, a really great question about, you know, okay, trends versus auth authenticity and where is the alignment there? And where is the lack of alignment there? And Jenny, I, I just feel like you've got a hot take on this. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I I just believe that you you should again, you, you should stay in your wheelhouse and know what's true to you. And so, um, you know, at MIT, we're not doing TikTok dances. You know, we're not sort of doing. We didn't do the sad gerbil. Was it sad gerbil or is the sad hamster like meme? But but we are all about pie day and you know like our our numbers and our like quirkiness and nerdiness and star wars day so that's what i mean by you know lean into your culture and do what makes sense for you you know if there's if there's a day or a trend and you know i have to google it to try to find a connection with M mit then i'm just trying too hard you know it it just should be something that already feels like a natural fit with your culture, you know, with your community. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I mean by like lean in, lean into your culture, right? Lean into what you do. So. Thank you. Yeah. And I like um, Kristen's point in the chat too. She's also emphasizing that it's, you know, got to think about that brand voice and what works for one isn't going to work for everyone. So that, that's an excellent point, Kristen. Thanks for bringing that up. Artists, we're going to stay on our uh, tangent train for a moment because Logan has been asking all the fire questions in this chat. Look at me, guys. <laughs> um, so, artists, I need to ask you about this one. Logan's wondering about human touch and AI interaction and where those two things live and where they oversect. And you are our AI expert here. So talk to us about this. So if we are coming at this from, you know, what, what the consumer, what, you know, wants, right. And what their expectations are, then it becomes really easy to think about when a human would be more appropriate and when an AI or something like that would be appropriate. Now, would a human be appropriate at 11 o'clock at night when somebody is in their pajamas or, or maybe they're in bed and they're, they're watching something on TV and they just want an answer and they just went on your website to find that answer, like a, a phone call would absolutely not be appropriate in that case. So AI has the opportunity to serve, um, you know, very fast, very convenient answers and, uh, and interactions in real time that a human cannot do in the confines of, of how we're working today. And that's, you know, perhaps the the 
first line of defense or how we should start thinking about human versus AI is that AI is filling a gap that we were not able to do before, right? Um, as AI gets better and better, we're going to hand off those communications and we're going to hand off that more and more towards AI. I talked a little bit about before how good these AIs are now at reproducing human voice with our tone our, and, and actually they're getting really, really fast. So there is really little delay between when they're, they're understanding, translating your, your answer into providing something back. Uh, as we move into the world where these large language models or AI models are, are multimodal, which means that they understand and speak not just text, but they understand and speak audio, they understand and speak video and, and images, and they're able to communicate that way as well, that, that, that lag is going to become very, very short. So it's going to get better and better. But right now, we're in a place where if you don't have somebody... Uh, on that front line, 24-7, answering questions or or helping in that experience, that is the first place that you should look about, you know, incorporating AI. And then over the next year or two, we're going to see more and more um, of, the, uh, of the other components being replaced. Let's stay on this topic of personalization and personalization at scale and where AI intersects. Uh, actually, Jeremy, you brought it up at the very beginning of this panel. 17.1% do not feel like content is being personalized. So clearly there is a challenge here. But we also know that to scale these efforts, um, it does require the use of technology, artificial intelligence. Um, most institutions are not in a position where they can just grow their team size or double or triple it overnight. Like we are actually more often in a position where there's a lot of open roles and it's hard to fill, right? The brain drain is happening in higher ed um, at an alarming rate. So this creates huge challenges to achieving personalization at scale because you might not have enough team members to, uh, to just execute on the normal day to day. Um, you might still be at some point in your learning curve around some of the new technology and AI that can actually help you do your job better, right? So it just kind of leaves us in a really tough spot. Um, can you talk to us about this, right? Like, what are your recommendations for starting to crack this nut? And, and do you have any examples um, where the balance maybe has been effectively achieved? Sure. And just to be clear, because I want to make sure that, you know, everybody's hearing that same stat. That stat from 17.1% earlier, Mallory, 17.1% feel like it's very personal, meaning that almost 83% then are saying, hey, Thank it's you. either, yeah, no worries. It's either completely, again, looking and sounding the same, or it just feels kind of somewhat personal, right? And so back to the goal of personalization, most schools in 2024, there are still, believe it or not, a few who do not have CRMs. Yes, there are people using constant contact to send campaigns. I'm not joking, right? But the large majority of schools, right, have a CRM that allows you to automate communications, before I get into any of that, I think one of the things I would encourage you if you're going to try to personalize at scale to do, if you, for example, work on a staff that's in enrollment marketing or marketing and you do not have a good relationship with your admissions team or vice versa, please find a way to collaborate more on things because you're all on the same team. I mean, students could care less about like who they get a message from. It's more back to all these things we've been talking about. Does it feel personal? Is it authentic? Is it relevant information that I care about? At the end of the day, it's a lot easier to personalize at scale and use your technology that you have when you're aware what your colleagues on campuses are doing. And that, before you can do any of the other things that you're going to hear from me and our panelists, I think is a super important point that I wanted to make. But ultimately, here's a couple of things I would encourage you to think about. So much of personalizing at scale is how you say what you say in any medium, right? So I mentioned earlier your language and your tone. Students, if you're going to be authentic, want it to feel more like an actual conversation versus, again, all you're doing is repeating things off a script or reciting something that you memorized. 
when you then ultimately are trying to have that conversation, start, for example, as your call to action, instead of always having a link or pushing them to sign up for a visit, start their application or submit their deposit, ask a direct question. Like right now, a great question for any of you listening to ask your admitted but undecided students on May 8th is, are you worried? Well, how are you feeling about making your college decision? You could ask that question because they're feeling a whole bunch of different ways. Or you could say something along the lines of if you were sending me that email, Jeremy, I'm hearing from a lot of other seniors that they're worried about making the wrong decision. But what about you? Because the number one, again, fear, according to all the data I have, is students are worried about making the wrong decision in this process. At the end of the day, you can create emails to automate all of those conversations, knowing that even if you send that email and you ask a good direct question to a thousand students, you're not going to get a thousand students to respond. You're not going to get anywhere near that, no matter how personal your message is. But if you can get 52 or 112, that opens up the door for different staff members from your campus, namely admissions, to be able to have additional conversations that feel more personal, that feel more authentic, that then make that student potentially feel like they're valued and wanted more by your institution. Something else I would encourage you to think about that's really easy within your CRM, are you segmenting your messaging? Meaning, I hope you're not sending the exact same message to inquiries and names that you buy. Or if you're having a message, do you segment it by year? Meaning a junior and what they want in this process right now if they're in high school is completely different than what a senior wants. Or do you segment by location? What an out-of-student wants and needs, excuse me, what an out-of-state student wants and needs is going to be a little different than a student who lives locally, right? All of these things can be automated and allow you to personalize at scale where you don't have to come up with, oh my gosh, a thousand different messages for a thousand different students. No, you have to figure out where these buckets are if you want to think of them that way and find ways as a collective group back to working again with different offices on campus, namely enrollment marketing and admissions, to send messaging out or communicate no matter the medium in a way that not only feels personal, but allows then the message to land in a way that wants the student to learn more. And the last thing I'll say is, have those messages when you communicate obviously come from someone, and I would argue it's probably going to be in a lot of cases a student's admissions counselor. But think about, for example, then that first message, all right? Students enter your system a whole bunch of different ways. They fill out your request for information form on your website. They're a name by they visit your campus, they raise their hand, they're a stealth app. All of these are different ways. What's the first message they get from your school? Like you all should know that. And if you don't, please write it down and go figure it out. But if you're sending the exact same message to all of them, it's not going to land in a way that feels personal. There should be a different message going to each one of those groups. And again, that's something you can scale and have all automated that doesn't need to be written every time a new student comes into your system. So going back, like I said, to personalization at scale, Mallory, it's just, it's using the technology you have, but then saying, all right, how do we use it as a way to save our staff time, but also generate more of these conversations that then help us help these students figure out if they want to take the next step. Yeah, that's well, Jeremy, you're assuming that, um, the best way is to actually push stuff out. They want to hear from us. Like that's that's an assumption, right? That we're making right now, that our messages going out actually are wanted messages. Um, well, I mean, at the end of the day, artists again talking to my daughter and you know other students who have gone through this process. Right, so many students are just like, I need this information. The key is to your point, correct? Knowing what I need. Right. Like if you're going to go out, for example, anybody listening to this who wants to make their campus visit better, students are like, I don't need an information session. You sticking me in a room and having people repeat the same stuff that's on your website. Like that's not helpful for me. I already know that. I want back to things like you mentioned earlier, other student stories, or I want something that feels more relevant to an interest I have. And so absolutely, it's understanding whatever you send them at any point in time hopefully you're sending them relevant information. Yeah. 
Yeah, and 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 the problem that we hear a lot is, well, I don't have the team to actually write all those things or, or to produce all these things at a personal level, and that's where you know we're I'm very bullish and we're very bullish here that AI and generative AI specifically can play a huge role in that personalization and can kind of be a more conversational way. Uh, and, and allow the the student to be in the driver's seat. So rather than us pushing content out, we understand what they're asking and then can have a conversation with them. Um, and it can drive that conversation in many, many different directions, just like a real person would. Uh, but actually having all the institutional knowledge and having all those stories and having all of those con that content that Perhaps I don't know if a biology student, you know, graduated and and we send fifty three percent of our students to here or there. So so that's that's where I believe AI can can kind of level the playing field and start being more personal and having those conversations and having the data into one place is actually how you would uh, amplify that even more because yes, they're being handed to different departments and they don't talk to each other. So data. Uh, centrality, having data in, into single place makes a lot of di a big difference, not just for the AI, not just for people, but also the AI, understanding all that context, the, the path that they have been on and so on and so forth to make that better. So we're very, very bullish around that. Uh, I know that we're running up on time, Mallory, so uh, I'll hand it back to you. Sounds good. And I'm actually going to give Jenny the last word because while we have been sitting here for the last 57 minutes talking about Gen Z, we certainly cannot forget about Gen A, who is right behind them, right? So Jenny, let's touch on that for just a moment. What can we do as marketers and admission professionals, enrollment management professionals, what can we do now to prepare for Generation Alpha? I just as we talk about Gen Z um, being the generation that did that grew up with like um, smartphones and mobile devices, Gen um, A, Gen Alpha will be the generation that always knew um, AI. Um, so I th I think it's it's not a question of whether you should use AI. You I think you need to in order to scale and to grow. But I think you really need to be smart about using AI, because this is a generate, like, you know, my daughter can point out what's been photoshopped, what is, you know, it's crazy. She's 11. Um, but they're, you know, but they're really, really savvy. And so, you know, what I liked about what you said earlier, artists, about knowing pop culture is that I think we have to get out of the mold about how we think, um, you know, uh, marketing packages look like it or what announcements look like, because we're, like you mentioned or touched upon, we're not competing against, you know, MIT and USC and, you know, Carroll Community College. Like, we're not communicating, like, we're not um, like battling each other or competing against each other. We are competing against Nike and Starbucks and um, the Chicago Bulls and the New England, like for their attention, right? And so I, you know, think about who really does these really well, like Taylor Swift's marketing strategy is amazing. Why do we have to be boring and dull and all print? We can, why can't we unveil and launch things like, like album drops? Like have it have a feeling of like we're about to drop, you know, our our dates for orientation or whatever it may be, but have like a little bit excitement um after it, you know, around it. Um and you know, Jeremy, my eleven year old daughter refers to me as bro too. And I and like I think that they use it like we use guys. I think it's bra. It's bro. yeah, it's bro. It's like gender neutral. And I'm like, I'm not bro. I'm your mom. Like, and so I don't think like me using that word would be cringy. Like you said, I think they want us to sound like adults, but I think they want us to cater to them like they want to be talked to. Just like we we like there's a certain way we all like to be talked to. Um, so I, I know that, you know, we're almost about to wrap up, so I will wrap it there. But, you know, I think I think we could we can change our mindset about doing things. I would love to see that. Amazing. Well, as we wrap up this very first Enrollify panel team, I can't thank you enough for joining me today. Folks who are still sticking around with us, bear with me for about two more minutes because you've just listened to three really smart and amazing panelists and they all have podcasts. And so if you've liked what they had to say over the last hour and you want to keep hearing more from them, you can tune in. They drop episodes 
either every week or every other week. And so Jenny Lee Fowler is the host of Confessions of a Higher Ed Social Media Manager. She covers the do's and don'ts and dynamics of the very complex and challenging social media ecosystem every other week. Jeremy Tears is our host of Mission Admissions on Enrollify. He just cuts through the noise like he did today, right? He just gets right to it. He gets to the good stuff. He packs it with straight talk, advice, tips, and strategies. And he brings a really great mix of pros from inside and outside our industry onto his show. And then last but certainly not least, Artis is the co-host of Generation AI, where he explores the latest news, trends, and developments. This ep- uh, this podcast drops episodes every week, but sometimes there's also bonus episodes when there's something really interesting happening in the AI space. So don't miss it. We have... Uh, We at Enrollify are made possible by Element 451, and Element 451 is doing an awesome webinar on May 22nd talking about Bolt Discovery. This is a AI-focused webinar. Artists will has already talked about how institutions can use artificial intelligence, and in this webinar, you will be able to learn how you can start to integrate AI right into the website experience. Um, it's fascinating. I've gotten a little sneak peek. You won't want to miss it. Uh, we will include links to all of these podcasts as well as this webinar sign up in our email that we send you tomorrow with this content on demand. So if you haven't had a chance to scan those QR codes, don't worry, we'll send you the links. All right, folks, it just goes by too quickly. We're two minutes over the top of the hour. We've talked about everything from ice cream to uh, the attention span of a goldfish. And hopefully we weren't cringe in the process. We can't thank you all enough for being here with us. Jeremy, Jenny, Artis, a special thank you to the three of you. And until next time, we'll see you soon, friends. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.